I sort of come at this from a few different angles. So we've got a lot of younger clients in our business who are sort of 35 to 45 who we're providing advice on. And every time there's changes in superannuation laws, it tends to, I guess, erode a little bit of the confidence and trust that they find in the system. So from our viewpoint, that's quite frustrating. And I think I can empathise with them that, you know, maybe they're not as confident about starting the journey. You know, sometimes I talk about these changes are meant to encourage people to start the journey earlier, but if you keep making tinkering changes, then it discourages people from doing that. So that's one of the impacts that we see for clients. They're going, oh, they're changing super again. You know, maybe I need to look at something else that I'm doing with my money. So that's, you know, that's a bit of a concern. Um, the other side of it is for our you know, pre-retiree and retiree clients, it's led to this being the busiest end of financial year we've had for a number of years. So um, people, you know, I guess, We've been trying to get communication out to clients through our meetings and regular communications earlier, but human nature is you leave it to the last minute and all of a sudden, oh, hang on, I heard there's some changes. What do I need to do? How can I take advantage of the old contribution laws? What do I need to do in terms of being over the $1.6 million cap? You know, what do I need to do with my transition to retirement pension? Those types of things. So um, I guess in a perverse way, it sort of creates keeps us in a job because there's changes and we have to give more advice, but often it's not adding significant value to a client situation by going back and revisiting strategies they put in place a couple of years ago just because of a change in legislation. So, um, yeah, certainly has made us busier um, this financial end of financial year than it has been for a while. Oh, look, there's no doubt that this, you know, this, these changes that come in that have come in sort of like a once in a decade chance given a change given 10 years ago we had substantial change and 10 years later we've got this change again um, look I think it's it's definitely kept advisors very busy in trying to deal to clients that are I think initially impacted out of this and whether that's be it's your last opportunity to top up your contributions um, because you're approaching the 1.6 million dollars or because it's the last chance that you could do up to 540,000 of contributions. A lot of discussions around there, but beyond that, I think a lot of the issues and concerns for advisors was around how do they manage the potential CGT cost-based reset that they can get on underlying assets within superannuation funds. And it's probably one of the a legislative change that drove a lot of complications and um, difficulties for advisors and clients and platform providers or, or superannuation fund providers because they all needed to deal to it and everyone probably had their different time frames when things needed to be you know determined by we need to put your applications in which I think for a lot of people actually said a lot of the work for this wasn't right at the end of 30 June yes the contribution side of things but anything on a pension side for a lot of providers you needed to get this done back in potentially back in May um, so the work started quite early uh, on, along this, but again, a lot of people just trying to deal to the difficulties about what do we need to do, what's the ATO's interpretation going mm. to be. Um, so it's been a really difficult period. I think from a client perspective, I think some clients have actually now seen, um, it's, it's actually helped to demonstrate them the value of the advice that their advisor gives whether it be the advice given over the last five or so years um, in terms of getting contributions into super that they're now seeing the benefit of doing it at that time and not leaving it until the rules have changed um, but i think also it's just you know the contact that advisors have had with clients throughout this period um, has been so significant and it just demonstrates the value of the advisor relationship with a client and it just reinforces why people seek advice and i think the, the real question probably is how many people that don't actually have an advisor have realised what the real impact of these changes are and what yeah. potential, you know, what that could mean to them now in a post 1 July environment. Um, that's probably the, the big issue that, that we don't know yet. We know the advised clients pretty much have all been dealt to. It's what happens with unadvised clients. I think the challenges have been around the dates that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't all like all happening around the same time. Um, and if you look back to when we first saw the change around um, super contribution caps and the effects that that had on TTRs quite some time ago and still does, but advisors having to go back and actually identify, oh my God, who was aff who's affected by this? Who do I need to get in contact with? So now we've just got even more strategy layers of um, self-managed super with the CGT concessions and then also the $1.6 million cap. But when you look at the $1.6 million as um, an isolated strategy, there's discussions that advisor needs to have because they might be needing to actually change the value that was sitting in the fund. Now, 
that needs to then suit their personal circumstances and any consequence that they might have had around ideas with what they were doing around growing that wealth. So there's a lot of conversations that have to happen. It wasn't just administrative um, paperwork that needed to be coordinated. Advisors needed to get back in front. Now that's a great thing because it contributes to the value of having a relationship with an advisor ongoing. If you had come in and just set your retirement strategy or you were in pre-retirement and think, I've got advice and I'll, I'll be set, I'm retiring in three or four years, then some of those um, changes have actually had a, a significant increase or change in the effect of what they thought they'd do. So having that relationship for someone to trigger that conversation with you or for you to know that you can go and ask those questions definitely contributes to the value of advice overall. But I agree with your comment. Did it contribute to the real value at the bottom level for the consumer? Probably probably not um, with the result of what those outcomes were but we keep tweaking with the super system unfortunately and does it serve the real purpose at the end not if we keep going the way we are it's eroding the value yeah, i think you're going to find a big range some people are, are ready and, and working towards you know having in place processes which are going to be fine and keep them up and running um, other people less so um, I think one of the key things we, we've been thinking about in our business in terms of the clawback, which is one of the issues which has created a lot of attention is, you know, how is that going to potentially impact what we're doing within the business? So from a commission viewpoint, we've been, you know, taking hybrid commissions for a long time, so it's not going to change on day one what we're receiving in that sense. But the clawback one is, is an interesting one. I think it's fair to say it's unlikely that you're going to be hit with an influx of clawbacks, clawbacks on day one just because new legislation comes in. So, you know, it's not something you're going to need to manage or be having provisions for where, the way we're looking at it. It's, it's a matter of across a whole book of existing in-force business and then you know, new clients as they come, come on. Um, we don't think it's going to be a sudden influx of clawbacks. But keeping in mind that we do need to be mindful of, you know, I guess, maintaining that relationship, making sure the advice is um, relevant and continues to be so with those clients and keep in touch with them over that you know, period of time, which we do, but it's another, you know, I guess, important little... Um, stick to make sure we, we're sort of keeping on top of that. Um, I think that's probably the one that's going to be the biggest issue for, for people to, to be mindful of as, as the legislation comes into force. One of the things that we obviously encourage our, our planners to do within their businesses and, and, and within their practices is, is, is to have a business plan in place, have, have that plan in place and have an understanding similar to what we do with clients on a day-to-day -day basis, but, but what's my financial plan, what's my business's financial plan and, and take into account what, um, what our sources of revenue are going to be and how they're going to be affected by different, different bits. Um, we, we certainly got a lot of um, feedback and comments during the, the process of Lyft being introduced and legislated. Um, I, I would suggest that's died off a lot now that it's in place. People, I think, um, have, a, uh, have a good idea of, of what the framework will look like and, and are now starting to figure out how it will affect their businesses. We're, we're having a lot of members that are coming to us with ideas and, and thoughts on different ways that they can structure remuneration going forwards and whether or not we think that that's an appropriate way to structure? Is that a legal way to structure? What are the implications of this? Um, but it's broader than just life insurance remuneration at this point in time. It's it's thinking about the whole business and and how different revenue streams will, will come in. Um, so I, uh, I I think planners who planners whose business is primarily built around life insurance are certainly sitting down and having a look at, at what the impacts are going to be and trying to prepare for that um, for, for the broader for broader planners more holistic planners I think um, it's just tweaking tweaking their business models I was going to say the one the one or a couple of comments that I to again I think most advisors um, I think most advisors probably across the changes and what the impacts are going to be because it's been talked about for a fair while um, and there's been plenty of time to start adapting models to what the new what it's going to look like going forward um, and I think when you go to the clawback and if you if you think about clawback sort of that you know, how do you get some of these commission payments back when policies are unnecessarily changed um, you know, that there's I don't think there's any argument about that side of things but you bring it back 
to really what's the first duty of the advisor is act to act in the best interest of the client. Right. And if that means we need to make a change to an existing insurance policy because what you had is no longer in your best interest and this is now the right one, that's the right thing to be doing. If that has a callback consequence, so be it. But we're still doing the right thing because we're actually giving the right advice to the client in the first place. So all these other things to me sort of, yes, they are consequences, they are things that people need to be aware of, but if we're doing the right thing for the client in the first place, then that's, that's the most important piece. Mm -hmm.